it is my privilege to introduce Milwaukee's mayor, yeah, Mark Gamba, who has served as our mayor since 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Gamba. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out on this cold evening. Uh, for starters, I'd like to thank my council, Angel Falconer, Lisa Beatty, Shane Abma, and Wilda Parks for another stellar year. We have one of the highest, we have one of the highest functioning councils in this state. And because of that, we spend all of our time working for the betterment of our city rather than playing the kinds of silly political games that we've all been watching at the federal level. And while we occasionally disagree about which priorities are most important or how to best achieve them, we always work with respect and with the knowledge that we are each doing what we believe to be the best for our city and the region. You can be proud of this fine group of people and we'll miss Shane's keen insight and big heart. But not to worry, uh, Milwaukee has many bright, committed, hardworking folks who have been serving the city in other ways, who, when the need arises, step up to put in the long hours and hard work of a city councilor. I'd like to welcome our newest council member, Kathy Heise, who was instrumental on our Climate Action Plan Committee over the last few years. I'd like to point out that that means that four of the five members of the city council are women. which may be historic, I'm gonna to have to find out, um, and it's long overdue. This is a trend we are seeing across the country and is sorely needed. If we are to truly have a representational government, then the makeup of the governing bodies needs to look a whole lot more like our populace. Good things are coming. Before I get any further, I need to thank a very special person that has been at my side and put up with my crazy hours since I was elected mayor. She is the rock to which my ship is tethered and the calm harbor of my soul. Please help me thank Kendra Geringer. I'd also like to thank our amazing staff, Ann Ober, Kelly Brooks, Peter Passarelli, Alma Flores, Steve Bartol, Denny Agner, Justin Garrick, Scott Stauffer, Leila Iman, uh, Reba Crocker, Katie Newell, Bonnie Dennis, and Gary Ribello, and 135 other outstanding, dedicated, brilliant staff members that have worked so hard to make this an incredible city. If I listed all the great things they've accomplished this year, we'd have to order out for breakfast. I will, however, do my best to hit the high points and to talk about our ongoing vision for the future. In 2040, Milwaukee is a flourishing city that is entirely equitable, delightfully livable, and completely sustainable. That is the opening line of our vision statement that was established in 2017. From that vision, the council is prioritizing the issues that move us closer to that ideal as fast as possible. Big issues like climate change and housing will take longer and are more critical, so, were two of the first, so they were two of the first three goals. Over the last year and more, we've taken a number of steps towards those goals. Many of those step, steps hit on multiple aspects of our vision. For example, the SAFE program, robust investment in our active transportation infrastructure makes our city more livable, it makes it more sustainable, and it makes it more equitable. To that end, this year, we developed our integrated transportation plan and we bonded for the first third of the SAFE projects. By the end of this year, a handful of those projects, including the Kronberg Path, will have been constructed, and the next set will be fully engineered and ready to be built by 2020. Over a nine-year period, we will build out most of the system. A few of the larger projects will require additional state or federal grant money and will be built as we secure those. This year, we received $1.1 million, a $1.1 million grant from the State Safe Routes to School Funds towards the construction of the Linwood portion of those projects. 
and we are well placed to continue winning grants from the multiple sources as we build out our system. Another item that was a former council goal and again addresses livability, equity, and sustainability is the Letting Library. Over this last year, we completed the design and won a summary judgment, which allowed us to rebuild rather than renovate the problematic old building. We secured additional funding from the state legislature, thanks to our former city councilor and state representative extraordinaire, Karin Power. We moved the library operations to its temporary home and broke ground on the new library. If all goes well, we will move back into our new, larger, net zero energy library by this time next year. At the other end of downtown, the uh, South Downtown Plaza design was completed in conjunction with the farmer's market and construction has recently begun in order to coincide with the construction of the Axle Tree Project, both of which should, get, should be completed by this time next year. With that completion, we should be able to move the farmer's market to its long intended permanent home. Customized with bollards to close the street and power and water access to meet its very specific needs. The completion of the axle tree will bring our first five story mixed use building online. The increased vibrancy of, this, uh, of the downtown should encourage even more services to locate here. Simultaneously, Milwaukee High School and Northwest Housing Alternative campuses are under construction. When completed, the high school will be 30% larger with state-of-the-art classrooms, in particular, the media center, makerspace, and science labs. It will have ample natural daylighting throughout and be energy efficient to lead silver standards. It will be an extraordinary institution ready to prepare our children to be leaders for the coming century. Northwest Housing Alternatives will have more than tripled the number of low-income units. It will have created 68% increase in the capacity of the Annie Ross House, and it will have actual office spaces for everyone in the organization with some room to grow. The entire campus will be very forward looking with offices built to net zero ready, which is to say very efficient building envelopes whose energy could be offset by solar on the roof. And the housing units are being built to the Earth Advantage gold standard. The slight additional cost of these energy efficient buildings will more than pay for itself by reducing their operating expenses significantly over the life of the buildings. As the city takes on more projects toward arriving at our vision by 2040, we have needed to hire a handful of new employees. In order to accommodate them, we have been re renovating City Hall. That project should be done by the end of the year, but it will be barely enough. And we will still have a split campus, which makes it hard to work um, across the disciplines. I would expect that we will need to have, start having the conversation around building a modern city hall for the 21st century sometime in the coming years. The city has installed new wayfinding throughout the downtown, created new walking, a new walking map, and implemented a Main Street Flower Basket program. Our downtown is truly blossoming. To make sure that this uh, that all of this continues to function smoothly over the last year, we developed a parking plan which will play out over several years as parking demands increase. The first, uh, this first year, we took the step of doubling our parking enforcement. Milwaukee is becoming more engaged. Each of our events this year, from the Umbrella Parade and Earth Day to Halloween and the Winter Solstice, were the biggest we've ever seen. We think there were over 4,000 people out to watch the Christmas ships and enjoy the bonfires this last December. We are continuing to add opportunities for engagement, participation, and community celebrations. For example, we won grants for our Maximum Music Happy Hour and our mini mural programs. We purchased insurance that will cover neighborhood block parties, and we created a process for painted intersections, the second of which was painted this year in the Island Station neighborhood. Our efforts to robustly engage our residents were recognized by our peers this year when we won the League of Oregon City's highest award for good governance. I'd like to talk for a minute about the work that occurs in this city beyond plans and meetings and discussions and construction. Our public works and police departments are made up of everyday heroes. 
What I mean by that is that they go above and beyond on a regular basis to keep us safe and to keep our city functioning well. As an example, during late September and October of last year, the Public Works Department, in partnership with the library staff and project manager Leila Aman, were asked to assist with the library relocation to its temporary site. Our water division installed new water service from Main Street to the temporary building. Our wastewater team installed new sanitary service to the facility across the TriMet parking lot. These service installations were completed in a very compressed schedule due to uncertainty related to the library construction and the lease issues with TriMet. Our facilities team were heavily involved in removing the shelves, books, and equipment from the old library and helping the library staff in setting up the new library. Damian Farwell, our fleet and facilities supervisor, was in contact with TriMet, PGE, and Clackamas County on a daily basis to expedite the design, permitting, and installation of the electric service. He was able, through his efforts, to compress what would have been a 12-week process into six weeks. The entire team focused on this task and worked diligently to make it make opening the temporary library in October happen. Another great story comes from our police department. Earlier this year, our SRO, uh, Lindsay Nold, was introduced to a young student at the high school that was struggling with self-image. One of the teachers had found this young lady sitting off by herself and crying and asked Officer Nold to meet with her. This student struggled with weight and her self-confidence and as a result was struggling to fit in with other students. Officer Nold said she felt drawn to the student because she reminded her of herself when she was in high school struggling with many of the same issues. As a result of the meeting with this student, Officer Nold was inspired to start a program for young girls that may not normally go work out with all the other athletes. She knew that if uh, these girls were struggling with self-image, working out in a gym with other students, many of whom were either boys their age or athletes, they wouldn't participate. Officer Nold pitched the idea of an all-girls after-school workout program to both the school and the police department and took care of the necessary logistics to make it happen. While others were welcome, she, was, she wanted to focus on the girls that normally wouldn't participate in an open gym. Lindsay leads each session and works out alongside the young girls. On the first night, it was just Officer Nold, the young lady, and her best friend. Each se session after that, it grew. Now, regularly, there are 16 participants in the program working out together twice a week. She says that they are not only uh, are each of the girls giving 100% in the gym, but they encourage each other both in the, in the room by cheering each other through the various exercises and in the hallways during school. This program has impacted their self-image, their confidence, and has bonded them together with other girls they may not have otherwise met. To me, this is a perfect example of true community policing and shows what a difference one passionate person with a big heart can make in the lives of others. It is the everyday work of the city that makes Milwaukee our home, and the more time I spend with our team, the more impressed I am by these daily successes. The council has the added responsibility of being aware of overarching issues, pushing the city beyond its status quo function, and creating opportunity to become the city we need to be in order to meet the changing needs of our planet and our families. Hence the three goals our council set in an effort to attain the city's vision by 2040. Milwaukee Bay Park, housing affordability, and a climate action plan. A lot of work went into Milwaukee Bay Park this year. We replaced the access bridge that was damaged by the record rainstorm in 2015. In doing so, we prefetched for the removal of Kellogg Dam by doubling the span, moving away from the dam, and adding a sidewalk to it. We also repaired and enhanced the beach access. The new stairs should allow for canoe, kayak, and paddleboard launching at any water level and should hold, hold up to future flooding. In order to facilitate that kind of boating with uh, the limited parking we have, we installed a new boat rack for short-term vehicle drop-off and pickup use. We replaced the pedestrian crossing of the drainage swale that was damaged by fire, and most importantly, we worked with our partners at North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District and our own PARB members to design phase three of the park. There were several events and a great deal of outreach. 
I think the results are exciting, and we will continue to support NCPRD as they begin the process of funding its construction. I should also mention here that NCPRD completed construction on one of our long-desired neighborhood parks. In a few months, you should be able to enjoy a day with your family at Wichita Park as soon as the plantings aren't quite so fragile. Our next goal of housing affordability is an issue that virtually every city in the country faces. For decades now, wages for the bottom 80% have not kept up with the cost of living, let alone the cost of housing. Home prices have doubled in Milwaukee in the last eight years, and rents have risen dramatically. I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone who's getting paid twice as much as they were eight years ago. The net result is that people who have lived here for a very long time are losing their homes, some of them with nowhere else to go. We have over 400 homeless school kids in the North Clackamas School District. Obviously, some of the solutions are out of our hands. I believe that the minimum wage should be a living wage. And that's why three years ago I proposed and we passed a minimum wage of $15 an hour for anyone working for the city. Sadly, we are preempted by state law from doing more. The governor and the legislature did pass a law increasing the state minimum wage, but since it was a compromise with big business, it is happening slowly. And frankly, I'm afraid that $15 an hour is no longer a living wage in the Portland metro region. It's probably something more like $22 an hour if we were to base it on the cost of a two-bedroom apartment. In reality, this is a federal issue. And until Congress passes a minimum wage that is equal to the cost of living, including housing, the cities and the counties will be scrambling to provide housing that is affordable for folks on fixed income, even folks with full-time jobs. I expect that housing will remain a top goal for this council as long as we are in office. Three of us on council and several staff members have been concentrating on this issue, so a lot has happened in the last year. I was asked to help create and then pass the Metro Housing Bond, and thanks to the wisdom of the voters, we passed this historic bond and the work is already beginning. Milwaukee is well positioned to take advantage of that bond, and we should be able to use some of the money to expand our affordable housing stock to take care of folks that have always lived here but are being priced out. Wilda Parks is serving on the county's housing task force, which is critical because all of the government-built affordable housing in Milwaukee will be built by Clackamas County. Angel Falconer is serving on the Homeless Solutions of Clackamas County Committee. The growing population of families falling into homelessness through no fault of their own must be addressed. Kids that experience that kind of uncertainty struggle in school, setting them up for a life of poverty, thereby continuing the cycle. Alma Flores and her, her team worked hard this last year to create the Milwaukee Housing Affordability Strategy, which we adopted in July. This is our roadmap to solving this critical issue. We've already begun working on some of the concepts in the plan. For example, we hired a housing econ and economic development coordinator, Valeria Vidal, to in part act as a dedicated liaison between the homeowners, renters, and rental housing providers. Early last year, we also implemented a construction excise tax for affordable housing. This is 1% on any construction over $100,000. It will give us some leverage to help cause more affordable and workforce housing to be built in what would otherwise be market rate developments. We have so far raised $290,000. We also passed the vertical housing tax credit, which is a 10-year tax abatement on mixed-use multifamily projects near transit. This will help encourage more and denser housing to be built in the kinds of places we want it. We have over 100 people a day moving to the Portland metro region and the developers are not building new housing nearly fast enough. This is why our affordable housing has become unaffordable. The more market rate housing that is built, the less pressure there will be on the naturally occurring affordable housing. Earlier, I mentioned that the Northwest Housing Alternatives project that is nearing completion. One way we were able to help that project come to fruition was by working to create a tax abatement on that property. 
as weird as it sounds, we as a state do tax, do levy property tax on nonprofit low income housing projects. I think that's an error. I believe that the power of taxation should be used to spur behavior and development that benefits the majority of the people and the planet and use that same power to discourage the behavior and development that is bad for the majority of the people and the planet. Hence, we will be working to make all affordable housing projects that sign a contract to remain affordable for 60 years or more property tax free in Milwaukee. As I said before, wages have not kept up with the cost of housing, so a large and growing percentage of the population is precluded from home ownership. One strategy for addressing this is to allow alternative forms of housing in our neighborhoods. Accessory dwelling units, cottage clusters, large homes with several living units inside them, row houses, and garden apartments are all forms of housing that used to exist in our cities 100 years ago, but racist, racist zoning laws have systematically disallowed them in the vast majority of the housing zoned properties. As we all learned at the Housing Forum to kick off the 2040 comprehensive plan work, these single family homes zones were strategically created to disallow African Americans and other minorities from home ownership, which is of course deplorable and the unattended consequences of those decisions at that time means that over half of our current population has zero opportunity to own a home. This council and staff are working to address these, his these issues head on. Through the comprehensive plan process we are currently engaged in, we are looking into the best ways to allow more types of housing in our single family neighborhoods. We hope that you will join us at our town halls and other outreach events to help us determine the best ways to create opportunities for more affordable housing options so that the kids who grew up here can afford to buy their first home here and retired folks can downsize here to help stretch their retirement funds. We have applied for and won grants to study cottage clusters and ADUs. We will be looking to make the code, fees, and processes for these types of housing much more attractive. Lastly, on a very specific project with a great deal of opportunity, Clackamas County, with our support, secured a master planning grant for the Hillside property. On 16 acres, next to a bus line and across 32nd Avenue from the hospital, there are 200 units of housing. The cottages are World War II vintage, and the tower, the tallest building in Clackamas County, was built in 1970. We have a unique opportunity here to create the neighborhood of the future. The county is working to renovate the tower and bring it up to modern standards. The rest of the property gives us an opportunity to build more housing in mixed use, mixed income development that utilizes everything that has been learned about urban design and highly livable neighborhoods. We could create enough modern housing on that property to be able to allow the current residents to live in healthier, more energy efficient buildings and create permanently affordable housing for the people all over Milwaukee that are being priced out of their homes. We can also include a percentage of market rate housing there as well, because we know that living in a neighborhood of, uh, with a diversity of incomes is healthier for everyone involved. A mixed use concept would allow for shops, clinics and other services to be mixed in on the ground floor, creating a neighborhood that contains many of our everyday needed amenities. But beyond, but beyond the increased quantity of housing and access to services, there is so much more that could be incorporated here. We could make all the streets Wuners. This is a Dutch concept that designs neighborhood streets to be much safer for pedestrians and bicyclists while still allowing for automobile traffic. We could add shared transportation opportunities from electric cars, electric bikes, and electric scooters to a shuttle service so that it won't be critical for people living on modest incomes to afford to own an automobile. This also means that we could potentially reduce the parking requirements, thereby allowing for either more housing or more amenities like playgrounds, picnic areas, community gardens, and orchards. 
We could even use the concept of a food forest throughout the landscaping of the entire project, giving people who have traditionally been denied access to fresh fruits, nuts, and veggies an opportunity to have organically grown produce growing in their front yards. Lastly, in partnership with PGE, we could create a smart city zone, an area where energy efficient, ideally net zero buildings produce, store, and share their energy on a modern microgrid. Demand response, heating, hot water, and vehicle charging stations could help smooth the spikes in energy consumption. This concept would make this neighborhood both very disaster resilient and prepared for the necessary changes we need to make in order to stop climate change, which as it turns out is our third goal. Our 2040 vision calls for us to be a net zero city by the year 2040, which is to say that our city will cause enough carbon free energy to be produced to make up for all the energy we need. This is a lofty goal. And sadly, as we learned last summer from the IPCC report, not quite lofty enough. We now know that we have 12 years to dramatically reduce the carbon and methane that we as a species are causing to be emitted into the atmosphere. We will also need to begin to adjust the way we grow our food and manage our forests in order to be able to draw back out of the atmosphere as much carbon as we possibly can. Obviously, this is not something any city or even any country can do on their own, but we need everyone everywhere doing everything all the time as quickly as possible to avert the worst of the disastrous effects of climate change. To that end, we hired a consultant and convened a group of really smart people, mostly from Milwaukee, to create a climate action plan. This fall, the council adopted that plan and the city hired Natalie Rogers to be our climate action and sustainability coordinator. She will be working with our energy providers and others to begin to transition away from fossil fuels as fast as possible. A couple of years ago, we set the goal of having 2.2 megawatts of solar energy here in Milwaukee by 2021. We had a moderately successful solarize campaign in 2017, and over the last few months, Elemental Energy has been busy installing the largest rooftop array in PGE territory in 2018 on the rooftops of Waverly Green's apartment complex. When that 400 kilowatt system comes online, we will be more than halfway or to our goal. By the time the high school and the library arrays are complete, we will be nearly three quarters of the way there. Stay tuned to the Oregon legislature. House Bill 2618 would create a solar rooftop grant program to reduce the cost of solar system installation for homes and businesses. If passed, this would actually be better in many ways than the, than the phased out RETSI because it will not matter if you owe taxes in order to receive the benefits. My hope is that this program will encourage another solarized campaign to bring us all the way home to our goal. Moving away from carbon dependent transportation system as soon as possible is criti critical to these efforts. And on that front, the city has partnered with PGE and our new Electric Avenue is only a few months from opening. It will add six new EV chargers to our downtown, four of which will be the DC fast chargers. The city has been actively replacing our fleet with all electric and hybrid cars. Even the police tell me they're ready to switch as soon as we are, the city is ready to buy them Teslas. <laughs> I previously mentioned that our safe pro I previously mentioned our safe program, which is designed to dramatically increase our active transportation infrastructure over the next nine years. This will give folks opportunity to choose walking, biking, or maybe even scootering over jumping in their cars for short trips. Speaking of scooters, the council will be considering whether to allow one or more of the scooter companies to begin operating here in coordination with Portland. And I personally hope to have the first shared e-bike system in the state by the end of the year. I try to ride my e-bike to most of my meetings around the regions, around this region. I find it fast and effective while still giving me a little exercise. I'm certain that I can get from downtown Milwaukee to downtown Portland faster than anyone in a car during rush hour. <laughs> You'll find it out front when you leave, and I'll, I would be riding it to my next meeting, but Wilda is coming with me and she just refuses to ride on the handlebars. <laughs> Right. <laughs>
<laughs> Part of our SAFE program is designed to allow people to access our mass transit system more easily. We recognize that in all the neighborhoods, that all not all the neighborhoods are equally well served by TriMet. And so we applied for and won a grant to study the possibility of creating a shuttle service within the city of Milwaukee. The council also pushed TriMet to begin transitioning away from diesel buses and into electric. Apparently we weren't the only ones. TriMet recently announced that they would start buying electric buses in an effort to be carbon free by 2040. The other half to solving climate change is to draw as much carbon back out of the atmosphere as possible. No technology we have for that is nearly as effective as trees. Our tree board has produced their draft urban forestry plan for Milwaukee, which calls for an increase from our current 26% canopy, canopy cover to a 40% canopy cover over the next 10 years. We know that trees do so much more for us than just clean our atmosphere, which is what makes planting and caring for trees a big win for the city and why we are a Tree City USA for the second year. Our two-person natural resources crew have planted over 165 new trees on city property and right-of-way over the last two months, uh, starting us down the path of growing our urban forest canopy. They really have made a concerted effort, and we are working to plant even more trees over the next two weeks, few weeks. The city strongly encourages homeowners to consider planting new trees and to protecting and caring for the ones they have. Planting fruit or nut trees is a double win because they will provide you with free, organic, and hyper-local produce for decades to come. Along with cleaning up our atmosphere, Milwaukee residents have a strong desire to clean up our rivers and the ocean. The council was spurred on by a new group called Milwaukee Environmental Stewards Group to outlaw single-use plastic bags, styrofoam, takeout containers, and other single-use plastic waste. Starting on March 1st, 2019, Larger businesses must provide only recycled paper bags or reusable bags at check, as checkout bags. Next year, I expect that the ban will be citywide. That is if the state doesn't beat us to it. It may seem like an unnecessary inconvenience, but if you had a chance to make it to our climate summit last year, you would have heard me talk about how our collective behavior on many fronts, from climate change to artificial fertilizers and plastic bags, are killing the oceans. The current prediction is that if we don't dramatically change the way we behave, the oceans will be effectively dead by 2040. The 16-year-old Swede, Greta Thunberg, who I strongly recommend that you look up her um, TED talk, she asks us to all stop talking about climate change and to act. From that action, we will find hope. Maybe that's why I'm hopeful, because I have the great fortune to be in a city that has chosen to act decisively to protect our home, the earth. Our actions encourage others. Bend, Oregon is currently using our climate action plan as a model, and the Clackamas County commissioners recently asked their staff to help set goals to become carbon neutral support energy efficiency, support green standards for development and infrastructure, and protect and restore lands, water, and air that support natural systems. <laughs> Action and hope are contagious. Cities, all over the, cities and states all over the world have stepped up to do this crucial work. And now you are starting to hear members of Congress beginning to seriously consider bold action such as the Green New Deal, which would both combat climate change and begin lifting people out of poverty and restoring the middle class. It is good work we do here. And with it, we move closer to being a flourishing city that is entirely equitable, delightfully livable, and completely sustainable. I'm very proud to be your mayor, and I thank you.